Good afternoon, brothers and sisters, and warm welcome and greeting to all guests and visitors worshiping among us this afternoon, not least those who are here for the baptism of the newborn child to Travis and Bonnie Peters, Nora Iris. Uh, the council has the following announcements. The consistory hopes to meet the Lord willing tomorrow evening at 7.30 p.m. in the church building. And our offerings today are for the work of Asian Mission. So far, the announcements, let us lift up our hearts to the Lord. Please rise. Congregation of the Lord, where does our help come from? Receive now the Lord's greeting. Grace and peace to you from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. Amen. Let us praise our God and our King by singing from hymn 44 all the stanzas. Let us now together with the church of all times and places make profession of our Christian and undoubted faith by singing together the words of the Apostles' Creed as they're set to music in hymn one.
Let us now go to our God in prayer and seek his blessing upon our worship this afternoon. Lord God and Heavenly Father, we have come together this afternoon to worship you, our great and holy and awesome King. We do so with our songs and our prayers and also by listening to your word and by witnessing the administration of the sacrament of baptism. Lord, in each of these ways, help us to express our gratitude for your guidance and your grace throughout our lives. And we pray that all of us may be able to worship you this afternoon sincerely and joyfully. Whatever our personal circumstances may be, May your word this afternoon show us the way forward to live in joy and faithfulness to you. And since we are unable in and of ourselves to even understand your word, we pray for the help of your Holy Spirit. We pray that he will give us illumination so that we may grasp what you want us to know from the Holy Scriptures. Father, we thank you this afternoon also for the freedoms we have as Christians in this country. Lord, it is not lost on us to see that in our society there is much hostility and hatred toward your people and toward the beliefs that we hold to. And so many in our day think that the teachings of Scripture and those who embrace them are extremist and dangerous. And there are so many who desire to silence the voice of Christians in the public squares of the nations. And yet we are here this afternoon without hindrance and under the protection of the law. And so we give you thanks for that freedom and that protection. We pray this afternoon for the civil government of our nation. We pray for our Prime Minister. We pray for his cabinet. We pray for all of our lawmakers in Ottawa, in Edmonton, wherever else, also in this county and township. Father, we pray that those who are called to govern our nation and our local areas would have a strong awareness of accountability. Accountability not only to the people who have elected them to serve in public office, but more importantly, their accountability to you, their Creator God, the Lord of Canada, the Lord of the province of Alberta, and the Lord of our local municipal region. We pray for all the leaders of the nations of this world. Lord, we pray that you will bless them in their callings. We pray for peace and for justice and for good order and for social stability. We pray for mutual respect and humility and dependence upon you to be displayed on the part of all who hold the levers of power. Father, we pray also this afternoon for your church, especially for the persecuted church, for those who are sharing in the sufferings of Christ. We pray not only for those who suffer the great risk of losing their lives, but also those who suffer oppression in other ways for the sake of the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, we pray that you will enable them to remain faithful under the pressures around them. Give them what they need to endure by looking to Christ who rules at your right hand and give them the strength they require to stand firm by the power of your grace and spirit. We pray that you will lift up the humble who put their trust in you and we pray that you will bring down the arrogant and the proud who raise themselves up against you and your kingdom through violence and through intimidation who attempt to silence your people. Lord, we pray that you will be present by your Spirit in our midst this afternoon. 
Give us listening ears. Give us attentive minds. And open our hearts so that we may not remain unchanged, but that by grace we may grow more and more to resemble and reflect the character of Christ our Lord. Father, we bring all these things before you, not because we are worthy or deserving, but we do so for the sake of your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ. In him alone we pray. Amen. As we prepare to open and read from God's Word, let us first sing from Psalm 145, stanzas 3 and 4. I invite you now to take your Bibles and open them to Paul's letter to the church in Rome, to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, we'll read together verses 12 through 30. Romans chapter 8, a well-known, well chapter. We read this in connection with what the church confesses in the Heidelberg Catechism. Lord's Day 48, regarding the second petition of the Lord's Prayer, Your Kingdom Come. We'll see how the kingdom is described here in Romans chapter 8. Begin our reading at Romans 8 verse 12 and read through to verse 30. Hear now God's holy and inspired word. So then, brothers, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. 
For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from, the, from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what the mind of the spirit what is the mind of the spirit because the spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of god and we know that for those who love god all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose for those whom he foreknew he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. So far, a reading from God's word this afternoon. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever forever. Let us now turn to the church's confession, the faithful summary of God's word as we find it in the Heidelberg Catechism in Lord's Day 48. Lord's Day 48, we continue through the Catechism's treatment of the Lord's Prayer, the prayer that our Lord Jesus taught his followers to pray we come now to the words of the second petition. And in Lord's Day 48, the question is asked, this is on page 561, the back of our book of praise. What is the second petition? Your kingdom come. That is, so rule us by your word and spirit that more and more we submit to you. Preserve and increase your church. Destroy the works of the devil, every power that raises itself against you, and every conspiracy against your holy word. Do all this until the fullness of your kingdom comes, wherein you shall be all in all. So far, the reading of the church's confession after the proclamation of God's word, let us respond in song by singing hymn 46, All the Stanzas of Christ Shall Have Dominion. Brothers and sisters in our Lord Jesus Christ, as we look this afternoon at Lord's Day 48 of the Catechism, combined with 
Romans 8, we come to consider some very remarkable truths which give us great encouragement for our Christian life. For what comes out of both Romans 8 and Lord's Day 48 is that in this life, there is a tension, there's a struggle that's going on around us in the universe in which you and I live. And this tension should also inform the way we pray so that we pray with a sensitivity and with an awareness of where this tension is leading towards. Paul speaks of it in the sense of the whole creation groaning. It's not just an occasional sigh from time to time, but the whole created order is groaning, ongoing groaning, with a sense of expectation, of longing, and of desire. But we find if we look at Romans 8 closely, along with many other passages in Scripture, that this groaning involves both suffering and glory. For on a number of occasions, Christ told his followers that, uh, that he would first have to suffer and then enter into his glory. And the New Testament writers follow in line. They repeatedly echo that. And they remind us and exhort us that if we are to share in the glory of Jesus Christ and live in, in this world for the kingdom of heaven, then we will also share in his suffering. And so this afternoon we'll give our attention to that idea, that imagery of groaning. Now maybe it brings to our minds the idea of a certain sound, but we can think of prayer and the Christian life as lived in a state of groaning. For groaning expresses both a state of, of present difficulty as well as future longing. That's the tension being played out in our Catechism lesson and in Romans 8. When we pray, we express both of these aspects. The pain of living in a world, experiencing the result of the fall into sin, and yet having hope and a longing that this universe in which we live will not remain in bondage, but that through Jesus Christ, all things are being restored and made new. And so I proclaim God's word to you this afternoon under this theme in the second petition. We pray for God's kingdom to come and satisfy our groaning and expectation. We'll consider first how we recognize his kingdom coming and secondly how we respond to his kingdom coming while there is much for us to see in Romans 8, and we will get to it this afternoon, if we first of all look at Lord's Day 48 briefly, what we see prominent there, of course, is, is the imagery of a kingdom. And it's not just any kingdom, but it's God's kingdom. And we pray specifically that this kingdom will come. Now this means nothing less than warfare or battle. It's a prayer for warfare because that was, how, that was the way in which any kingdom would come by taking over the kingdom that was in power before and bringing it into submission. And so when Christ declares, repent for the kingdom of God is near, as he said on a few occasions, and in many of his parables said the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed, like a man going out to sow seed. We, we're led to think of warfare and conflict. For these were declarations that the kingdom of Christ was overtaking the kingdom of the world and, and the devil's dominion. For as Christ himself would say, if I cast out demons by the finger of God, you can be sure that the kingdom of God is at hand. So when we pray, your kingdom come, 
we're recognizing that the kingdom, the conflict, has been set in motion. And therefore the first part of, of Lord's Day 48 is emphasizing our need to be submissive to that, to be part of that kingdom, not to oppose that kingdom, but to submit ourselves to it by the Spirit of God, making us more and more compliant and obedient to the King's edicts. Rule us by your word and spirit, the Catechism says, so that more and more we submit to you. That's what we pray for. But then this prayer is also a prayer for militancy. Think here of the writings of the Apostle Paul when he describes the Christian life. He often uses the imagery of warfare. The Christian life is not passive. No, we're not merely spectators sitting around twiddling our, our thumbs waiting for the time to pass. We're not, we're not just on some sinking Titanic going down in the ocean, waiting for our Lord Jesus to come again to rescue us. No, we are involved in warfare. Paul says, put on the whole armor of God. In Ephesians chapter 6, he says our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. You get the insight there, I'm sure, that there is this mammoth struggle that is happening bef between the forces of the devil and the forces of Christ and his kingdom. And so we pray, your kingdom come, praying, preserve your church and increase it, make it grow. Destroy the devil's work and every power that raises itself up against you and every conspiracy against your holy word. The last time regarding Lord's Day 47, the first petition, you may, the hallowed be your name, you may remember that the first petition, you were told, is a missionary prayer. It's a missionary prayer. So is the second petition, is it not? When we pray, your kingdom come, we are praying that God will enlist me and enlist others in that great army of the kingdom that is advancing. The gates of hell will not prevail against the church, Christ said. Above everything else in life, we want to see this kingdom flourish we want to see the knowledge of the Lord cover the earth as the waters cover the sea, to use the words of, of Habakkuk, the prophet, as well as the prophet Isaiah. We want to be able to say with, with the fullest meaning, Christ shall have dominion over land and sea. That song we'll sing after the sermon is composed in such a way as to bring that out, to bring out that sense of triumph, that sense of expectancy, when we, which we see when we, when we see and we hear about the gospel being brought out all over the world, even to those places where people were formerly openly hostile to the gospel and to the Christian faith, where people are accepting it embracing it, believing it, and their lives are changing as a result of it. And it's often small. Often small. Like, like Christ said, the kingdom is like a mustard seed. So small. Yet, it, yet it, the small things are amazing proof that little by little, Christ is gradually and, and progressively destroying the devil's work and all his opposition, and how does he do it? Well, it's not with fighter jets. It's not with tanks, or with bombs, or with military force, or human might, but with the, with the power of his Spirit, by the preaching of the Gospel, in these ways. So the Lord's Prayer is a prayer for militancy in those terms. But it is also a prayer of triumph, 
We're not in an ongoing battle that has no end in sight. We are not living in a world that, that is going around and around in circles, going nowhere. No, the Catechism makes it very clear that what awaits us on the horizon, distant though it may be, is the day when all conflict will be resolved and, and the Lord will make his enemies his footstool. You get the picture. Victory. Conquering. That's what we pray for when we pray, your kingdom come. We're praying, Lord, advance your kingdom. Advance your work. Send out your word and spirit so that the day will come when Christ is all in all. So that's the, the prominent and prevailing image in Lord's Day 48, a kingdom coming involving warfare and militancy, but ultimately ending in triumph. That's a truly glorious thing to pray about. And it is a wonderful way also in which to live our lives. We must remember this. Those of us who are tempted to despair in light of, of disappointments in this life, when we have low hopes and low expectations for our government, we shouldn't set our, our expectations too high, or when we have low uh, expectations about the direction of society and which way it's going, we can nevertheless have confidence that the kingdom of man will not prevent or impede the kingdom of Jesus Christ. And let's not only remember that, but let us also labor in light of that fact and give everything we have to that work so that we may show how good, how great, how glorious is the kingdom of God, which he is busy preparing by living lives according to his word, and which, we, which will, uh, can, it can already now preview the kingdom that is coming, preview it for those around us. This uh, now brings us to our second point, looking at how we respond to his kingdom coming. And moving now to, to Romans 8 specifically, in the passage we read earlier, the image of the kingdom presented there is slightly different than in Lord's Day 48, but the theme of, of tension is still there, nevertheless, throughout this chapter. For the imagery that Paul uses here is that of labor and childbirth. It's quite a provocative image to be sure, but one also found elsewhere in Scripture. Paul is, as it were, saying he, he brings us into the, the maternity ward for this momentous event. And there's pain and, and there's exertion, certainly Certainly the mothers among us know what this is like to give birth to a child and all that's involved. And of course, it, it can vary. Some have a relatively quick and, and brief labor, but for others, the labor ends up being prolonged, being arduous, being exhausting. Some are right back to their daily routines at home and in, in no time, in no trouble. And some would think, if I didn't know better, I wouldn't think that he had a child. But here in Romans 8, we are given the picture of intense and even prolonged pain leading ultimately to the blessing of new birth. That's the, the picture here. That's the tension here. And that's why Paul speaks of groaning. He speaks of the believer groaning. He speaks of the creation groaning. He even speaks of the Spirit of God as groaning. Isn't it interesting that he uses that language? It's a groaning that on the one hand certainly includes the groan of sorrow. 
When we pray your kingdom come, we're praying with an awareness of the profound sorrow and hardship and difficulty of this life. For notice verse 18, Romans 8, 8, 18. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed in us. Here we see the, the connection between suffering and glory. But the suffering, that, that suffering remains real. Now, of course, comparatively speaking, that suffering is insignificant compared to the glory that is going to come and be revealed, which we will see one day in full measure. But for now, we are living in that time in which the whole creation is suffering in this state of pain and anguish. And drawing our attention to verse 20, we read there that the creation was subjected to futility. Now what does that mean? It means the same thing as that which was spoken to the first man and woman in Genesis 3, that as the result of the fall into sin, there would be thorns and thistles, and there would be pains in childbirth. For when they sinned, they had not only violated God's commandment, but had also brought upon themselves the effect of God's curse. And so struggle and sorrow and every form of misery entered the world in that day as a result of sin. And all work and all life difficult. And so it is for us in the, in the duration of our lives until Christ returns again. We're going to experience and we're going to witness this and we're going to live in this environment of constant tension because of that curse. Paul says the creation was subjected to futility and another translation of that word futility is the word vanity. What does it what, it, what does it mean to live in vanity? It's not simply the idea of someone standing in front of a mirror for a long time, preening themselves, as some might think. No, vanity, according to the biblical, bi biblical definition, means living with a sense of emptiness, living in rebellion against God, and denying reality. The creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of Him, God, who subjected it in hope that the creation would be set free from its bondage to corruption. In other words, we see all around us the evidence of what sin does and has done. It not only makes us guilty before God, but it also has the effect of corrupting and corroding the whole created order. That's why we have these enormous so-called natural disasters, tsunamis, mudslides, hurricanes, that sweep thousands or even millions to their death. These give evidence of a creation subject to futility. We see it also in the poisoning of, of creation, in, in pollution, uh, in the environment. We see conflict of every sort. We see assault, physical, uh, domestic, sexual, verbal. And there's, and there's unrighteous anger channeled in, in all kinds of directions. Sometimes people are just mad and they don't know wh who they're even mad at. And yet Paul says the glory will outweigh the pain. Verse 22, For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. This is the one side of what it means to, to groan as we pray. It means to pray in the awareness that we live in a world that has been redeemed by Christ and yet has not fully experienced the, the reality of that redemption. 
we can know that we have been saved, we've been delivered, and yet we still experience the effects and the consequences of the fall into sin. And we'll, and we'll hear it later in the baptism form in a short time that our children are even conceived and born in sin. It's so pervasive that it affects each and every one of us. And so there is a pain and a sorrow. There's a sense that things are not yet what they ought to be. And those of us who are elderly in age may have the, the greatest awareness and insight into this. They not only have the groaning that comes with, with growing older in age, in the increase of the, the number of infirmities and, and afflictions that come along with that, but there is an awareness that things are not as they, as they sh- should be, a greater and greater awareness. And there are others who, who look back on their lives and they see the great measure of, of their rebellion against God. They reach... Uh, and they have a strong awareness of the many ways in which they, they have failed and they, they experience groaning in that sense. And then there are those who experience the pain of, of witnessing in this world, living and witnessing to this world that's living in rebellion against God. They reach out and, and they reach out and they reach out only to be met with hostility against God and refusal to accept His His grace and His blessing. But there's another part to this groaning. For while it certainly has that sense of being painful and hard, yet we know that the pain of childbirth has its hope. Because as a, as a mother experiences the, the pain of childbirth and labor, yet the groaning has an end. It has a destination of joy and delight and new life and new birth, such as has been experienced by a family in our midst this week. And that's precisely what the Apostle Paul says, not only about the individual cre- cre- uh, Christian, but also about the whole creation. Each Christian lives and prays with the awareness, that awareness that we are groaning in expectation and longing and desire in the same way as we groan, at the same time as we groan in pain and sorrow. Well, verse 19 in Romans 8 says, For the creation waits in eager longing. What's the creation waiting for and longing for and looking ahead to? What is it exactly? It's waiting for that labor pain to lead to the point of a child being born in the sense of God's intention for this world and His promises and His plans of salvation being brought to their fullness, to their consummation and their final destination. The Apostle Paul says that means the revealing of the Son's of God, that we will experience salvation to the fullest. So I ask you, what is the highest privilege of the gospel? Is it to be saved? No. Is it to have your sins forgiven? No. Is it to have the righteousness of Christ as our own No. Those things, they're all great. They're all glorious things, to be sure. But the highest privilege of the gospel is that we may be children of God, citizens of the kingdom of the great king, who are members of that royal household, and so princes and princesses. And so notice verse 23, and not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption as sons. But elsewhere, 
the Bible speaks of us already being children of God. We already are children of God, sons and daughters of God. That's true. And yet, in another sense, we are waiting for the fullness of that. What we are now in part, we will be fully. What's incomplete now will be complete. What's hidden from sight today will be made manifest in the sight of all. The womb that is in labor, which possesses that child, is not going to remain that way forever. For that child will appear, will be delivered, will be received into the arms of a mother. Well, that's the imagery here. We pray, says the Catechism, according to that kind of longing and desire and expectation. Yes, things are not as they should be, but one day all things will be made new. One day in a world that is filled with so much sorrow, there will come a time when there will be joy such as we have never known or experienced what Lord's Day 22 says regarding the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting, things we look forward to, meaning a, a glorious existence, a perfect blessedness. It's going to be incomparably joyful and delightful. And so isn't that something we should be praying for? That we may know the fullness of that joy of God's kingdom having come. We groan inwardly till the day that we are adopted as sons and receive the redemption of our bodies. When that day comes, we will receive our glorified bodies. Then we will experience salvation in its fullness. For in this hope, Paul says, we are saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope for who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. That word hope here, of, of course, means more than wishful thinking. It means uh, that hope is not hype. That, that hope is that knowledge and that inner certainty of what God has promised, what I can only see through the eyes of faith and only just glimpse at a distance I'm going to have and to hold as my very own. That's what it means to pray your kingdom come. That's what we are praying for. And in the midst of all of our sorrow and disappointment, and heartache, and pain that we see all around us, if we just take a trip to the hospital or to the nursing home, it will reveal it to us if we don't see it otherwise. As we witness day after day the, the profound groaning, we will, we will see it, that what we have heard about in this passage. Yet our prayer is, Lord God, grant to me the faith to persevere so that I may take full possession of what you have promised to me, that joy of redemption, that joy of adoption, and the fellowship that no eye has seen, no ear has heard, or anyone has experienced or imagined here on earth, a blessedness in which we praise God forever. That's what we pray for. And so the second petition is all about groaning. But to say it another way, it is about praying on tiptoes. Praying on tiptoes. Just think of that image. Perhaps some of us who are tall or taller, it's not an image we can easily appreciate, but think about a, a young person, small in, in their stature, so that they always have to go up on their tippy toes in order to see things. Not everyone has this problem, but if you're short, you, you know this. And so when we, when we are on our tiptoes of faith, what do we see? Oh, we see what the world is blind and, and unable to see, that in the pains and in the sorrows of life, we see the sons of God coming into their own. 
As we peer into the future, we strain our eyes to see as, as far as we can, we can see what God has promised, what he is accomplishing. We see a better day is coming, the day of his kingdom arriving in fullness. And what does that do? Well, it says, uh, it gives us, says Paul in Romans 8, 25, patient hope. And so to pray the petition, your kingdom come, is to pray with longing and expectation, to pray on tiptoe, to pray as those who are patiently hopeful. And we can be, we can be sometimes, brothers and sisters, uh, so eager that we might lose our patience, might wonder why it's taking so long. Well, we must not be like that. We must be patient throughout our sufferings, for they will continue until Christ comes again. But we must also not be too patient that we lose our expectation, we lose our eagerness, we lose our, our work ethic for the kingdom. You see then that wonderful balance that is there in that patient hope. We live eagerly but patiently. We see the kingdom now coming, but we see it dimly. But we see it nonetheless. And because we see it, we know that life is living and work for the kingdom is work that is worth doing because there is hope in the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For his kingdom has come is coming and will come. And so let us pray in that way and let us live as we pray. Amen.
Baptism has been requested by our brother and sister Travis and Bonnie Peters. Let us now turn to the form for the baptism of infants, which we can find in the back of our book of praise on page 597 and following. form for the baptism of infants reads as follows, Beloved congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, the doctrine of holy baptism is summarized as follows. First, we and our children are conceived and born in sin and are therefore by nature children of wrath so that we cannot enter the kingdom of God unless we are born again. This is what the immersion in or sprinkling with water teaches us. It signifies the impurity of our souls so that we may detest ourselves, humble ourselves before God, and seek our cleansing and salvation outside of ourselves. Second, baptism signifies and seals to us the washing away of our sins through Jesus Christ. We are therefore baptized into the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. When we are baptized into the name of the Father, God the Father testifies and seals to us that He establishes an eternal covenant of grace with us. He adopts us for His children and heirs and promises to provide us with all good and avert all evil or turn it to our benefit. When we are baptized into the name of the Son, God the Son promises us that He washes us in His blood from all our sins and unites us with Him in His death and resurrection. Thus we are freed from our sins and accounted righteous before God. When we are baptized into the name of the Holy Spirit, God the Holy Spirit assures us by this sacrament that He will dwell in us and make us living members of Christ imparting to us what we have in Christ, namely the cleansing from our sins and the daily renewal of our lives, till we shall finally be presented without blemish among the assembly of God's elect in life eternal. Third, since every covenant contains two parts, a promise and an obligation, we are, through baptism, called and obliged by the Lord to a new obedience. We are to cleave to this one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, to trust Him and to love Him with our whole heart, soul, and mind, and with all our strength. We must not love the world, but put off our old nature and lead a God-fearing life. And if we sometimes through weakness fall into sins, we must not despair of God's mercy nor continue in sin. For baptism is a seal and trustworthy testimony that we have an eternal covenant with God. Although our children do not understand all this, we may not therefore exclude them from baptism. Just as they share without their knowledge in the condemnation of Adam, so are they without their knowledge received into grace in Christ. For the Lord spoke to Abraham, the father of all believers, and thus also speaks to us and our children, saying, I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. Peter also testifies to this when he says, For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. Therefore, in the old dispensation, God commanded that infants be circumcised. This circumcision was a seal of the covenant and of the righteousness of faith. Christ also took them in his arms and blessed them, laying his hands on them. In the new dispensation, baptism has replaced circumcision. Therefore, infants must be baptized as heirs of the kingdom of God and of his covenant, and as they grow up, their parents have the duty to instruct them in these things. 
in order that we may now administer this holy sacrament of God to his glory for our comfort and for the upbuilding of the congregation, let us call upon his holy name. Let us pray. Almighty, eternal God, in your righteous judgment, you punish the unbelieving and unrepentant world with the flood but in your great mercy saved and protected the believer Noah and his family. You drowned the obstinate Pharaoh and all his host in the Red Sea, but led your people Israel through the midst of the sea on dry ground by which baptism was signified. We therefore pray that you in your infinite mercy will graciously look upon this your child, Nora, Iris, Peters, and incorporate her by your Holy Spirit into your Son, Jesus Christ, so that she may be buried with him by baptism into death and raised with him to walk in newness of life. We pray that she, following him day by day, may joyfully bear her cross and cleave to him in true faith, firm hope, and ardent love. Grant that she, comforted in you, may leave this life which is no more than a constant death, and at the last day may appear without terror before the judgment seat of Christ, your Son. All this we ask through him, our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son who with you and the Holy Spirit, one only God, lives and reigns forever. Amen. I'd like to ask now for the parents to rise. Beloved in Christ the Lord, you have heard that baptism is an ordinance of the Lord our God to seal to us and our children his covenant. We must therefore use this sacrament for that purpose and not out of custom or superstition. That it may be clear then that you desire baptism for the right purpose you are to answer sincerely the following questions. First, do you confess that our children, though conceived and born in sin, and therefore subject to all sorts of misery, even to condemnation, are sanctified in Christ, and thus, as members of his church, ought to be baptized? Second, do you confess that the doctrine of the Old and New Testament summarized in the confessions and taught here in this Christian church is the true and complete doctrine of salvation? Third, do you promise as father and as mother to instruct your child in this doctrine as soon as she is able to understand and to have her instructed therein to the utmost of your power? What is your answer, Brother Peters? Sister Peters? I invite you now to come forward. After the baptism, we will sing together from Psalm 107, stanza 1. Nora Iris Peters, I baptize you into the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Please rise and stand to sing.
Let us now go to God's throne in thanksgiving. Let us pray. Almighty, merciful God and Father, we thank and praise you that you have forgiven us and our children all our sins through the blood of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ. You received us through your Holy Spirit as members of your only begotten Son and so adopted us to be your children. You sealed and confirmed this to us by holy baptism. We pray through your beloved Son that you will always govern this child, Nora Iris Peters, by your Holy Spirit, that she may be nurtured in the Christian faith and in godliness, and may grow and increase in the Lord Jesus Christ. Grant that she thus may acknowledge your fatherly goodness and mercy which you have shown to her and to us all. May she live in all righteousness under our only teacher, king, and high priest, Jesus Christ, and valiantly fight against and overcome sin, the devil, and his whole dominion. May she forever praise and magnify you and your Son, Jesus Christ, together with the Holy Spirit, the one, only, true God. Our gracious God and Father, we thank you for gathering us together a second time on this Lord's Day to worship you, the one, true, living, and eternal God. Father, we thank you that we may know you as our God and that we may be your covenant children adopted in Jesus Christ. We thank you for your covenant love shown towards the the generations of your people. We marvel at your goodness, your faithfulness, your mercy. We thank you for all that you give among your people. We thank you for granting to Travis and Bonnie and to their wider families this healthy new child. Lord, we pray that you will provide for them as parents, that you will give them and to all the parents among us much love and wisdom and strength to raise their children to know you and to love you and to walk with you. Father, we thank you that also in this way you are growing your church. We thank you for all the children that you've given to this congregation. We praise you for your promises to them to work in their lives and for giving them a place in which they belong to your church and within the covenant of grace with all of your people. And we pray that the day will come for each of them that they will embrace your promises with faith of their own, making profession of that faith as their own. Lord, we pray that you would continue to gather, defend, and preserve your church through the generations and in this community and in this nation and among all the nations. And so, Father, show your glory as you establish your great and glorious kingdom. Even in spite of the groans of suffering that we hear and know and even experience all around us, we pray that you will cause it to serve your kingdom's coming. The day when we will know the wonder of being adopted as your sons and daughters in the blessing of eternity. Lord, help us to wait patiently and in hope and in expectation for that day. And may all that we do serve to speed your kingdom's coming. Now, Father, we pray that also in the coming week that you will give us all the things we need for body and soul in order to fulfill the callings that you have given us. Give us the love and ability to show mutual support and care in the communion of saints toward all those who are struggling in various ways. Continue to bless the activities of the Life Renewal Program. Bless the catechism classes and the training in the faith that goes on there and 
in every other environment, also the Bible study groups, all the other activities taking place in this congregation give to us all the desire and the love to study your word and to apply its truth to our lives. Lord, use it all to keep us on the path of faithfulness and obedience as those who belong to your kingdom. Father, be with those among us who are lonely. May the communion of saints be a real experience of blessing to them. We also pray for those who have need, and we pray that you will give to them their daily bread, and with their bread everything that is needful for body and soul. And Father, to that end, we pray that you will bless our offerings, our financial gifts this afternoon. We thank you for the opportunity to share from the resources that you have given to us, and we pray that you will bless these financial means for the growth and expansion of your kingdom. Father, provide for each of us in all of our needs, in whatever we do and wherever we go, in our homes, in our work, in school, in our families. Provide richly by your grace so that we may honor you above all and that we may be a blessing to our neighbors and all, all of our faults and, and shortcomings may be covered in the blood of our Savior Jesus Christ. So also forgive all that was sinful in your sight this day, even in our time of worship. And Father, hear us. Hear our prayer, for we ask it all in Christ's name alone. Amen. The Lord now gives you opportunity to worship him through the offering of your gifts. And after the offering has been collected, let us sing our closing song from hymn 74. And let us do so standing.
Receive now the Lord's blessing and go your ways in peace. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.